everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Tech Talks by CMIC. Today's episode will focus on ERP implementations, challenges, and best practices. And today we have joining us Jason Applebaum, Chief Service Delivery Officer. Welcome, Jason. Great to start. So I wanted to ask you, with your extensive experience in ERP implementations, what are the most significant changes you've seen over the years? I've been with CMIC uh, since 1999, but I joined the services team formally in, in 2007 and took over as managing uh, the, the, all the implementations. So quite the journey, right, and, and quite the change. So I'll kind of run through sort of what, what I see in terms of the changes from 2007. 2007, when people bought you know, our enterprise system or business management system, uh, they were buying it for the organization, but truly focusing on siloed uh, items, meaning the financials were just sitting on their own doing the financials, anything project controls sitting on their own was very much siloed as it relates to the overall implementations. Definitely the left hand was not speaking with the right, right was not speaking with the left. Then the journey continued, I would say, probably, you know, uh, you know 2012, 13, 14, where uh, a business process mapping became a thing. And, and they did want very much integrated, um, but they wanted to make sure that when they were implementing, they were serving everyone's needs. And by serving everyone's needs meant to them, they were customizing everything. So the, from an industry standpoint, we had all these systems, but all these customizations. Uh, so no standardization. So customer A would have their procurement process. Customer B would they have their procurement process. Customer C would have their procurement process. Likewise with forecasting, likewise with job billing. So very much uh, customized to fit their needs. So um, obviously from an implementation standpoint, very much difficult because every customer that you would go to, there was that, uh, didn't have that unified model, right? Then moving into sort of 2000, I would say 18, uh, we took a philosophy, and I took a philosophy of code current. Uh, code current meaning, okay, let's stop at the customizations. Let's try to embody that unified model, meaning incorporate automation, but have those standards. Uh, we created what we call Design Hub, which is listening to what your needs, how you do business, and then bring to the table what our recommended best practices is moving forward. So you don't have three different procurement processes. You have a single one and then you discuss the benefits and the pitfalls of those and then move forward. But philosophically, the code current, meaning the application, had one code set. So everyone, sorry, everyone was on the same code set, so it's easy for QA, easier for deployment, and easier for an implementation because you had one element, but introducing R&D on top of that to ensure that you stayed current with other industries and, of course, your competitors. Now, moving forward into 2024, 2025, and in the future, you take that code current philosophy, and then it's easier to incorporate items like APIs, right? So if you want to integrate with another system, you have that standardization of a, of, of a product that would allow for that. Or moving into the AI, the AI framework, again, everything sits within you know, the core database, CMIC has all the data, whether it be financials or procurement or project controls or payroll or human resources or equipment, whatever it may be, is in that core. And it's standard as it relates to the application use. So then you could easily apply things like AI, automation, and the use of um, APIs. All right. Um, so we'll go on to the second question. Uh, so in your professional opinion, what are the biggest challenges that organizations face today when implementing an ERP? In uh, enterprise deployments, you have to be cognizant of the number of individuals involved. Okay, so it goes back to um, the products that we've mentioned just previously in terms of evolution of, of you know, the enterprise platform. But you could have finance, you have commercials, operations, procurement, payroll, human resources, security, IT, all those individuals and all those teams, both men and women, have to, their needs have to be taken into consideration. So when I take a look at, you know, some of the challenges that we see uh, from an enterprise platform deployment and from an industry and deploying an enterprise system such as CMIC, 
all those business requirement needs are need to be taken into consideration. And what I find uh, as part of those challenges, uh, part is kind of the remediation or that next phase of where we're heading, similar to in technology, that open enterprise, the APIs, you know, the AI, like I mentioned, OCM, organizational change management, is becoming um, very progressive in terms of what the needs are to service some of those challenges. Because when you're trying to uh, implement an integrated system, such as CMIC, where you have all those modules or functionals or uh, departments or divisions, you have to serve the needs. And the left hand has to see what the right does, the right has to see what the left does. So from those challenges, I see that you know, the biggest one is when you come into an opportunity, um, servicing all the departmental needs becomes one of the biggest challenges. Thank you. So uh, I'll just move along to our next question. What would you say are the best practices that ERP or software implementation teams should apply today? So best practices, Ooh, there, there's a lot. So let's start from the top. Best practices in terms of uh, large enterprise sort of deployment is setting expectations, right? Setting expectations, and I always say that, and a lot of people always roll their eyes sometimes when I say that, but it actually truly is, you know, from the outset, setting realistic expectations. Like you're coming into this journey, this platform that's going to take 9, 12, 18 months, whatever it may be, what are the expectations and what are the conditions of satisfaction? And I use the term conditions of satisfaction is what am I looking to get out of this? Am I looking to get out automation? Am I looking to streamline my purchasing uh, process? Am I looking for uh, a streamline uh, process between timesheets and, and processing payroll? So there are a number of conditions of satisfaction that from the outset need to be established. That's number one. Number two, I would say, is identification of what I call pain points and opportunities. Okay, so what are my pain points? So in my current organization, and that could be people, that could be process, or that could be product. So what are my pain points? Like, why am I selecting another system? What internally do I have to change uh, from a business process? Uh, what people's roles and what they do are some of those pain points. And then I look for opportunities, right? What are the opportunities that I'm going to see now moving into a new system? So expectations, pain points, and opportunities are definitely, definitely uh, th the first. And then rolling into that establishment of that core, um, what I refer to as design hub. So that, what I mentioned before, that business process reengineering in terms of okay, I want to analyze and assess people, process, product, and then I want to come up with a streamlined standardization process. So I don't want to have four different purchasing processes into a product. I want one single standard that whether I'm doing self-performing or if I'm doing general contracting, uh, what can I, what was that standard process that I could fit into the application? And then what are the benefits of that? And what are the pitfalls? So taking that upfront time in terms of doing that assessment by taking it all from expectations, running it all through down to that benefits and pitfalls going through a process like a design hub or business process reengineering re is how you kind of establish those benchmarks. Awesome. Thank you. It's very insightful. So uh, given your experience in implementing software throughout the globe, are there any regional differences in the way firms do this? So uh, I would say yes, but to me, what's intriguing or, um, you know, where I see the major benefit is culturally, all right? So uh, I find, and one of the obviously huge benefits of uh, my job and meeting new customers and meeting them on a personal level, not only on a professional level, is what I'd love to do, right? So whether in UK or, or Mideast or Mexico or, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, you know, the, the cultural differences is where, where I, I love to learn and I love to, love to build those kind of established, uh, those established relationships. Actually, in probably 2013 or 14, I forget which, which year, that is where the evolution of our drawing management and markup uh, tool came from. 
Gordon and I were at a place called KPO, and I took out my phone, and they were explaining what they like, what our software should be doing. And I was like, "You mean this?" And I just took a picture, and I, it was on my old Samsung, and I drew through it. And they're like, "I said that's what you want." They're like, "Yes." And then Gordon's like, "Okay, well, that's what we're going to do." And that's, you know, those types of discussions and conversations and relationships um, is what you know, from a global standpoint is very impactful to me, my job. And I think, you know, in terms of, you know, the rest of my team, uh, that when we go through these implementations and think about it, we have 60 people as part of our team and each one of them who travel as well and experience have similar sort of, you know, experiences, which is awesome. That's amazing. I think we have a lot to learn from other regions for sure. <laughs> Um, you brought up a good point, which is something I've noticed that we do at CMIC, even on the product development side, which is the, basically uh, incorporating customer feedback. So from what I'm hearing, that you've incorporated customer feedback into your implementation processes. Oh, definitely. So like customer feedback, uh, you know, first and foremost, is the most important. People say, what do I, why do I enjoy my job so much? Is because every single implementation is unique and different. Why? Because there's always something that you're going to learn, lessons learned from the previous one that you could apply to the future. Every, and, I, and I mean every single one. So, you know, that feedback from the customers during the implementation that you could incorporate moving forward um, or moving forward in terms of processes, you know, similar to our product has changed so much. Um, likewise with our implementation methodology. But feedback and growing as an individual and being able to um, establish those uh, you know, lessons learned that you could deploy uh, across your team and especially some of the newer employees that join the company, uh, share those experiences, share those lessons learned, have them sort of experience themselves and bring back feedback so you too could learn, you know, something that you may not have identified or someone have told you is very important in terms of establishing not only relationships, but successful and continuous work with said companies because they know you're listening, you care, and you're actually implementing some of the recommendations that they told you. Thank you. Um, so before we wrap up, I thought I'd just ask you a very gen general question, but um, how do you stay on top of current trends and uh, developments? So I, I find myself, um, you know, obviously as as part of you know the, st the strategic leadership team at, at CMIC, um, we have a lot of insightful individuals, you know, like Gord Rollins, president and CEO of CMIC, very progressive in terms of industry needs, what is out there, visiting customers, listening, learning, um, and bringing that back to back to the office. I would say um, I do read a lot of the trade magazines, a lot of stuff that Farhana you put out there in terms of what our customers are doing. Uh, not for, so much from a product standpoint, but from an industry standpoint. As a, for instance, in 2018, uh, when Mass Timber, the first time I heard about Mass Timber, I'd never heard of it before, um, where sort of they re erect rather than steel and concrete using timber. And they were doing it in San Francisco. And I was like, wow, this is from an industry specific standpoint. And then kind of parlaying that into application, what are some of the needs of, that we would need uh, from an implementation both from a uh, you know estimate to sort of uh, setting up the system and what kind of nuances are going to be required you know like fire protection it would be huge with using now timber versus steel right so having that conversation with customers about that uh, and seeing that through in terms of its evolution like in, in Canada now um, they just actually announced this week starting 2025 that previous you could only erect a building uh, six or twelve. 12 floors using mass timber. Now you could do 18. So that evolution from 2018 till now, going through from West Coast all the way to the East Coast now to Canada, both from an industry specifics, so this would be mass timber as an example, through a deployment, okay, what do we have to do differently and think differently or set up and configure differently so that if a customer does choose mass timber, how would that affect their deployment? Thank you. So I did say that was the last question, but if it's okay, I'll ask one more. Um, what advice would you give uh, to anyone who was pursuing a field, pursuing your field in particular? I would say, you know, in, in our field, and the re reason why I say it's difficult to answer, because in uh, enterprise 
implementations. There are so many channels that you could come into, like the PMO project management office, right? You could be a project manager, assistant project manager, a project coordinator. You could be a business analyst, a consultant, or a trainer, uh, a data migration specialist, integrations, integration sort of consultant. So there's, so there's an array of individual that coming into it um, is very powerful, impactful, at the same time confusing which channel or which career path that you want to take. I would say this, coming out of university or coming into CMIC, just like many other individuals, either business or software is your interest, right? And someone that wants to, of course, work hard. So you have to work hard, put in the hours, and then ensure that you really want to do what this is and over time, pick which channel you sort of you want to embark in. But I think you know it's exciting. You know, I, well, I've been doing it for over 20 years, uh, as it relates to uh, you know CMIC and, and the services. But there are, I would say, the average tenure at CMIC as it relates to the service team members is over 10 years anyway. I would say, from the, my experience and the people that we've brought on, is you know business or software have an interest in either or and want to work hard. Well, thank you once again, Jason, for sharing your insights and your knowledge. Um, and thank you all for joining.